thank you all for joining us. This is, uh, session's situational awareness, and we're looking at location mapping, IoT, data, video. Uh, last session, we were looking at, at uh, voice and push to talk and all that. And here, we're going to talk about pretty much everything except that uh, <laughs> that's out there. Um, got a, a great group of panelists. Uh, they, they really know their stuff. And uh, we're lucky, lucky to have them. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, let me double check. They didn't give us any housekeeping items. So, uh, you know, again, what, what we're trying to look at here is, uh, again, broadband is, is changing an awful lot of things out there. Um, and, but it's, it's having to work with systems that frankly were not designed for broadband initially. And so um, things are transitioning, whether that's next gen 911, uh, FirstNet, uh, Verizon Frontline, you name it. Um, but you know, there's still an awful lot of very valuable uh, legacy components out there and, and making it all work together is, is, is a challenge. And uh, that's some of the stuff we're gonna be talking about today. So let me let the guys introduce themselves. Uh, Rodney, why don't you start off? Yeah, thank you, Donnie. Uh, I'm Rodney Murray with Skydio. We make uh, drones, US-based company. Uh, if you, let me just ask real quick the audience, have anyone here use drones or have drones in their programs? Okay, quite a few, that's great. So it's not a real new topic, uh, as some of you are very familiar with it. Uh, I've been in the wireless space now for all my career, I actually worked, uh, in Verizon's robotic business technology uh, prior to coming on at Skydio. So I'm very familiar with communications, worked on macro cell sites, microwave, you name it. Um, so this is my, sort of my sweet spot, if you will, for the company. I work in the enterprise side of our business. We do have a full uh, SLED team that does a lot of the uh, law enforcement and fire emergency. And also we have a big Fed presence as well. Uh, there is a lot of uh, push in the drone market to be on uh, U.S. made drones. And so we're 100% manufactured in the U.S. Uh, and our systems run on cloud systems. So we do use a lot of the connectivity to get uh, data back and forth. And, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Ed? Thanks, Donnie. Good to see everyone. Thanks for everyone uh, for taking time out of your busy days to be here today. It's good to see so many familiar faces. My name is Ed Parkinson. I'm the president of public sector at Rapid SOS. <clears throat> We're an intelligent safety platform, uh, specifically for the 911 ecosystem, where we ingest data through our software into the ECCs and able to push that data out to first responders to give better situational awareness, accurate, accuracy for location, and just a full suite of other data. Um, Donnie talked about how a lot of the systems that public safety have to use today weren't necessarily designed for broadband. And I think what you've seen over the last three or four years has been this extraordinary evolution in the use of data by first responders. And I think too, the ingenuity of the marketplace to provide different solution sets in a way that gives the best and most accurate information to the first responders in the best, most efficient way possible. So we are but one of those solution sets and we have a, an enormous ecosystem of partners, which we rely on to really provide that solution set for public safety. Okay, and Dan? Hi, Dan Muncie, the Fire Chief County of San Bernardino. County of San Bernardino, for those of you that aren't situationally aware, is the largest county in the United States. We go from everything to metro to mountains over 12,000 feet um, to the California desert. As a matter of fact, if you go west, the first California county you'll hit is San Bernardino. You keep driving for about four hours, you eventually hit Los Angeles County. Um, I'm a Skydio fan. Mm -hmm. They do some great things. Real quick, we, we, uh, we have a lot of incidents in our jurisdiction and uh, recently we knew we were gonna have mudslides. So we flew an area and mapped it. And then after the mudslides came in, sure enough, there was a bunch of destruction and flew it again. And, and being able to use your software was great. I'm a rapid SOS fan too. You guys are doing great things in the industry. And I will say, cause it's an international um, conference. It's great to have you here um, <laughs> to sit next to the guy from Chicago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Southside Philly, right? Yeah. We got a bunch of the international cats here. Hey Tara, good to see the guys from Finland here. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, um, Ryan, why don't you kick us off and tell us you know, what you're seeing in the, in the drone market, how they're being used, and uh, what's changing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I could spend a lot of time talking about drones in general and 
and it looks like from judging from the room, there's a lot of experience out here. So I don't really want to focus on, you know, what does a drone do and how can we use it in the public sector? I do want to focus on, since this is a communication oriented uh, conference here, I want to talk about the data and how do we use the data and how do we get more data and push more data. Uh, and so with that, I want to talk about autonomy. So autonomy is, uh, it, as it sounds, it is the ability for the drone to think on its own. We give a lot of uh, processing power to the drone. Uh, at the core of our autonomy system is a vision-based system. So we use uh, six 4K, 4K navigation cameras to create a sphere of, of vision, just much like the human eye and the human brain interacts. Uh, the drone sort of sees it the same way. We don't, uh, we don't necessarily texture it like the human eye sees everything in textures, although we can, we just don't reserve, or we reserve uh, the processing power for navigation. So that gives us a big sort of foundation to build on. And at the core of everything in, in the autonomy system is the ability to navigate. So what does that mean in the public sector? You can take drones and you can put them in places you couldn't put other drones, mm -hmm. mainly because other drones use GPS, they use magnetometers, they use other type of RF-based navigation systems. And I don't think I have to tell anybody in this room that RF can be interfered with. And so how do you get a, a drone in a critical location in a GPS denied location without communication to these devices? And so the way we do that is with vision. So there are some uh, really in interesting things once you sort of enter that base autonomy, what you can do now is basically give the drone the, the ability to think on its own. So it, it does kind of sound a little sci-fi and a little, you know, dare I say, artificial intelligence, but it does have the ability to do these fully autonomous, you know, from semi-autonomous to fully autonomous uh, missions. And so, I'm glad, Dan, you brought up the mapping. Mapping is one of the big things that we do because you can actually go out and see the environment and then collect data. So what we're trying to do is give uh, public sector tools to help them do their job in a way that's more meaningful, right? And the ability to communicate uh, in real time or near real time is also, so for situational awareness, for example, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of uh, folks in the LEA space that are looking for patrol overwatch. They want their drones out there. They want a situational awareness uh, in that, you know, whatever that scene is. They want to be able to put the uh, bird's eye perspective out in the field ahead of their law enforcement agencies and their, their agents uh, to obviously keep the agents safe, but also give them more intelligence on the situation on the ground. So we can do a lot of things like we can fly a drone up to the edge of a building and we have a thing called perch. So you can literally set the drone while it's active and live and set it on, on an edge of a building and now control the camera. What that does is give you a lot longer time in the air because you're not spending all that battery power keeping the drone in, in the air. You literally fly it to a place and land it, keep the drone alive. And now you have a very extended period of time where you can position the camera and look and, and those type of things. And then obviously with thermal, we can do a lot with search and rescue. We can see uh, heat signatures in real time. So we're able to put drones out and you know, maybe a, a heavily dense forest area looking for somebody that might be trying to hide under a bush with a thermal signature. You can see that very easily. Uh, and so that gives them a lot of situational. And then we work with uh, folks like Axon to do uh, integration with uh, body cameras and situational. Uh, there's a company called DroneSense, if you're familiar with them. We work with them closely in trying to uh, you know, give that real-time data. So obviously all that stuff has to connect over a network. Uh, what we look at it as, you know, it come, when you're talking about wireless networks, sort of there's two things that come to mind, latency and bandwidth. So if you have a lot of data and you're trying to push this over the wire or over the wireless connection, uh, that can cause a lot of bandwidth issues, cause a lot of latency issues. So what we're looking at is a command and control model much like a joystick, you know, remote control with joysticks in your hand, the pilot will give command and control uh, signals to the drone. We can do that through uh, now extending it through the wireless network. So the one thing we just released in uh, December is our dock is called uh, drone remote operations. So now we can stick a drone in a situation in a semi-permanent se setting, connected to the internet, connected to power, 
and then control it from any computer in the world. And so now we have folks that are really pushing the envelope on what they call a drone as a first responder. So that's not really a, a new thing to Skydio. It's, uh, it's been in the market for a little bit. There's a number of companies that are doing it, but having the ability to remotely control that drone and get that data back to the command, command center is vital. And so I think what you're gonna see is this evolution of autonomous features being expanded as communication systems get better, um, as regulatory environments start to change and get softer around what we can and cannot do in the airspace, I think you're gonna see a lot more applications expand. Okay, and so what, typically what are you, what kind of communication are you using to, to direct the drone? And what does that, that link look like now and, and how could that change in the future? Well, um, so right now with our remote operation, we can actually just connect into an existing fiber or, or wired connection. Uh, we see that a lot. But in the case where we don't have that ability, uh, we can connect through 5G, LTE, and, and actually put that on the drone. So now you're seeing a lot more drones with 5G LTE connections built right into the drone itself. So with, with edge computing, uh, you get semi-near real-time uh, computation with the computation power on the drone itself, we, we run a very high processor, nine neuro network processor on the drone itself. You can push uh, basically smaller packets out to the drone that then are just command sets that tell the drone what to do and actually the, the computing power on the edge or the computing power on the drone will give it uh, an extended processing power. So, you know, a minimal connection I would say is a 5G LT type connection. Okay. and. Um, just to clarify also, the, the form factors of your drones, how big do they go and how small can, can they be? Yeah, so uh, I mean, we have to work within the rules of the FAA, so it's less than 55 pound drone. We are uh, what I'd consider a small uh, form factor, so we're not really looking to carry these big heavy payloads. Um, there are manufacturers that do that and have that capability. Our focus is really about the autonomy and about the software that, that uh, resides on the drone itself. Uh, so if we're carrying big payloads and things like that, you might have to look to uh, a different manufacturer for something like that. Okay, but uh, like I've seen drones that are all less than the size of your hand, so you all aren't doing any of that stuff, right? You have yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they, they range in size, but I'd say this is probably a mid-size, uh, you know, two cool. to three pound type uh, four factor. Very cool, very cool. And from the US, which is a big deal with a lot of the funding that's coming out right now. So Ed, tell us, what are you seeing out there? Um, all, all this data, how do, how do I get it into the command center? I think what's really, really interesting, especially when you look at the 911 ecosystem, is how the market and how the call takers in ECCs have had to evolve over the last two, three years to changing circumstances, to changing data flows, to the just the just a huge amount of data that's now coming into an ECC. I remember I was sitting at this conference a few doors down, maybe four or five years ago, and there was a conversation around 911, next generation 911, where it was going, and the conversation really went to the, these ECCs are going to turn into mini fusion centers, right? Because it's ingressing all this data. The, the question mark then is how will a call taker be able to ascertain what is the right information to separate and to get into the hands of the women, the men running in harm's way. And so what, what we at Rapid and what many other companies are trying to do is to be, potentially make sure that that information that is being put in front of a call taker is the right information at the right time for the right situation. And, and that's no easy task because you know, information for Dan and his team would maybe necessarily be different you know, for other folks, one county over. Um, all, all disasters, all, all responses is local. So you have to really think about what are the local needs? How did you get the, the right information tailored for those like local situations? So we rely on this suite of partners. Uh, we have over 90 partners that we integrate data from in the Rapid SOS ecosystem through both our portal product as well as our premium product. Um, and, and we integrate that um, through KPIs into the eco, into the portal, the a bigger part of the platform that we have built at Rapid SOS, and we're seeing a dramatic uh, a dramatic uptick in the last just even eighteen months of the use of Rapid SOS in ECCs. How call takers are able to get that information quickly, 
ascertain is the right information we put in their hands and, and then and then pushing that information out and you know we continue to try and drive and increase the number of partners with whom we work drone companies the access just in, ingress data as much as we possibly can um, so that again we can provide accurate information on location on situational awareness and a variety of other factors for public safety okay and you mentioned all the partners and you guys have had a bunch of partners and i'll be honest Sometimes the, you see Uber, Grubhub, what does that have to do with public safety? Tell us how that information can actually be helpful. Yeah, I mean, safety. just think of it too. Those of us, how many times have maybe you've been in an Uber and on your phone it shows the car is actually a block and a half around the corner, whereas it's not exactly where you're supposed to be. I mean, who's had that situation happen to them, right? Um, accurate location is super, super important, making sure that that information coming in from our partners uh, and put in the hands of the end users is crucial. Uh, the little safety application you see inside Uber, the little shield when you're driving, that provides situational awareness and safety for not only the passenger, but also the driver. Um, we have partnerships with Grubhub providing similar solution sets that you're able to provide driver safety um, in ways that up to this point had not been able to be provided. So again, it's I think look, as we're looking at a post-COVID ecosystem where the digital economy is evolving just so quickly, you know, Roddy, you mentioned AI, right? I mean, chat GPT. That is just the beginning of where we're going down this path. It's going to be fascinating to see, I think, how AI is going to integrate into public safety um, in many, many different, many different verticals, not just, say, in law enforcement. But I think um, using some of those examples of how we've been able to really try and stay at the forefront of how we can provide safer solution sets to public safety using the power of you know, the data partners we have. Okay. Well, now, now all you need to do is figure out a way to to monitor the health of the person after they've eaten the Grubhub food in there. As yeah, a public no, safety look, thing. It's a little, no, too, it's a little uh, too, uh, what was that movie? Minority Report for me? So, <laughs> there you uh, go. We'll leave that up to you, Don. You can write an article about that. <laughs> sure, sure, huh? sure. It'll be a bestseller. Yeah, yeah we'll be happy, happy to write it. Somebody just needs to invent it, right? Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, Dan. So there are all these options out there, tons and tons of IoT sensors. And, and Ed brought up a really good point. You know, how do you decide which stuff is actually important to you and your mission? And of course, you, well, your mission as a as a, a, a fire in the firefighting community versus the the guy that's a police officer versus the EMS um, or the NGO. They all have different things. What are you all seeing now? And how do you, how are you doing it so that frankly this doesn't just become you know data tsunami and now I don't even know which way's up. Good question. Any EMS personnel in here? Doctors, nurses, uh, paramedics, a few of them. So we, when we go to paramedic school, we learn something. It's, it's um, before you give medication, right patient, right drug, right route, uh, right concentration, right dose, and then allergies. Many of you guys remember that. It's the same thing with information. Is um, It's critical that when we're giving medication to the patient that we're following these steps. And it's critical when we're receiving information, that we're receiving the right information to the right person in the right format in the right way of the right security levels to ensure that that data overload doesn't exist. Um, but I think there's a bigger problem here, Donnie, and that's, you know, as a paramedic, I could reach in my med box and I had the medication that I was trained on and needed. But as a first responder, there's no depository for information. Information is collected in just a variety of different ways and often um, it's in servers still, or it's in the cloud that you can't access, or there's, there's building information on this building somewhere. This wasn't designed on paper, but we have no access to it. And so with available technology, you're seeing LIDAR and the ability to scan the rooms. There's more and more information, but where are you going to keep this information? And I'm happy that Rapid SOS is moving down the route of understanding these different data points that are going to be important to public safety and synthesizing these data so they'll be able to distribute it. Um, the conversation on AI is fantastic. Edge computing, fantastic, because you're right. Ed, with edge computing, we need to send less and less information. Um, AI is making those decisions for us. Autonomous drones, um, UAS is semi-autonomous, is important not only to Skydio, but I think a lot of the processes and a lot of the devices that we're gonna be utilizing in the future, um, whether they're wearables or they're employables, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, 
are you all running into legal issues at, at all? And um, I bring it up from the standpoint of, I was talking to one of the guys that uh, work with some school security um, solution. And he said, you know, mm -hmm. hey, call 911. And as soon as you call 911, they can turn on the, the school cameras and people can, can see into them and things like that and see what's going on. And I said, well, that's nice, but I mean, they're calling 911 for a reason. <laughs> Something happened. Are they allowed to look at the, what happened, you know, 20 minutes, the 15 minutes before that caused the 911 call? And he said, at, at least in his jurisdiction, no, I, I can't, I'm not allowed to see that because basically I'm not supposed to be looking at uh, the cameras in the school uh, because, you know, I'm basically spying on, uh, on children. And so, and I was just kind of curious if you guys were running into things like that or smart buildings, I can see somebody saying, yeah, I, I want public safety to have access to, to all my IOT and smart building stuff, but I don't want you to have it all the time <laughs> and, um, make, making sure that that works in a way that, uh, um, you know, helps public safety make informed decisions while they're on the scene. But I can see the building owner saying, yeah, but I don't want you all sharing stuff that either my competitors can get a hold of because now it's public information or, you know, frankly, you just messed up. If, if there was a fire in there now, suddenly I've got to jump through six other hoops with my insurance company because this stuff is out there. I think that's where I was going with the, with the five patient rights. Mm -hmm. is that um, there's so much available information out there. You, you just can't, you, you can't, as an individual, you can't understand it all. You can't synthesize it. You can't package. Actually, it's not even information. It's data that we receive that we need to interpret into information. The securities that exist in today's world are very limited. And so because of that, a lot of jurisdictions don't have those policies, procedures, mm -hmm. or the abilities in place to receive the kind of information you're talking about, the school cameras. We're very limited. Ed's completely right that we're looking at the transition from communication centers into fusion centers. But with that, there's the data packages that are needed just to um, sustain and create the operational ability in those centers. Um, so permissions is important. If, if you take what the state of California is doing with their next generation scout system, which is also called Interra in a lot of people's viewpoints. See, Interra is the, the, the engine that's running it. You assign securities based on what your needs are. Um, it's, it's a fascinating subject of where we're going to go, but we need to take the human decision element out of a lot of this. We have to use AI in order to take this data and turn it into information and then ensure that it's routed to the correct location at the right time. I think there's, there's another piece to that, Dan, if I can add on to that. So it also takes forward thinking jurisdictions to who are looking to integrate these type of solution sets, new kinds of technology in a way that they have to have their council working creatively. They have to work with their business partners very, very creatively. And they have to have, um, you know, county supervisors and forward thinking members of the public who can really understand the net benefits this can provide in law enforcement. Maybe it's community safety in, in, fire, fire, in fire situations. Maybe it's, you know, better accurate location just on Z axis, right? to provide safest working environments. So it's about, I think, uh, a combination of what we've got probably sitting in this room, right? You've got government leaders who are very willing to make an effort to get out there and try and find the right solution sets in a, in a way. It's business partners and, and you know, the, and the industry coming together to understand, well, what maybe works in San Bernardino County doesn't necessarily work in Fairfax County, Virginia, right? So maybe you've got two different kinds of legal teams in those counties. The problem is that a lot of the situations we have right now, we do not have a one size fits all ecosystem in public safety. That's a good thing and a bad thing, right? So you've got to have forward folks who think a little bit creatively, almost are the sort of guinea pigs out there who are able to put, put ideas forward and actually make this work. And then a lot of folks I think you find will um, see, oh, it works in San Bernardino County. So now we can take those lessons learned and, and generate solution sets from that. But it takes leadership. There's a bit, a bit more to it because you can have the forward leaning chief and it's a good way to get fired. Yeah, totally. Um, you, you have to ensure that your cultures change. You have to make sure that you're training the workforce and to accept the, the new talents that are gonna be required to deploy your vision 
uh, you need to create the backbone to be able to support that. Um, because it, frankly, you can go and buy an off the shelf drone right now, but if you're thinking truly about um, the five essential missions for drones, which uh, suppression, um, ignition, uh, over, overwatch, surveillance mapping, logistical missions, if you think about how you're going to deploy that five to 10 years from now, well, it's not off the shelf. Um, the final thing you need to do is you need to reallocate your budgets, mm -hmm. which is another problem and why there isn't this adoption of technology. Frankly, we're spending way too much money on legacy technology we don't longer need. Yep. So it's the vision, but it's the practitioners and it's the education and the industry on how we're going to get from point A to point 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of legacy technologies, you know, the last session was about voice um, and this one isn't, but I am curious from your, your perspective, Dan, out in the field, how has all of this data, video, um, information impacted the voice traffic that you're seeing? One of the things that I'm hearing, purely anecdotally, there's no study on this, but that, um, frankly, uh, where once upon a time, the only way you could communicate was voice. Literally everything was being run through the LMR network. And some of the things I'm hearing anecdotally is, hey, now the only time I have traffic on the LMR network is, it, you know, it's an action, it's, it's an urgent situation, it's, uh, it's very mission um, specific because frankly, all the other stuff, you know, I, I know the location of everybody, I don't have to ask them where they are, I, I have pictures on the ground, I have all this information, I have text, so I don't need people to, uh, the, I don't have to have people repeat things all the time. And I'm just kind of curious what you were seeing out there. Yeah, as a fire service instructor, any instructors in the room? Yeah, there's a, they always teach you that people receive information differently. And it's like only like 69% of what you hear is what you retain. And there's body language and there's other uh, intonation on how to get points across. And that's why most of the audience is falling asleep, right? Because we're speaking and don't have a great video in the background. Um, but so the last session, I think I was uh, speaking at 11.15 and I received a text that less than 45 miles from here, there was a train derailment with 55 cars. And so in the past, I would have to rely on, rely on radio transmission in order to get the information. Now we're using digital dashboards in order to communicate the information to the right people. And that's the elected officials, that's me. And it saves me about 20 phone calls and saves people a lot of voice traffic. Um, but it has led to much better radio discipline, which I think is, uh, you know, decreasing the bandwidth that we need for uh, voice transmissions. Well, I, you know, I think uh, I, uh, right as right after um, AT&T had received the contract, there was a convention in, uh, in Nashville, and they, they talked about, and again, this was five years ago, um, they talked about the, their MDTs and they said, frankly, a lot of them didn't want them. They didn't think they were necessary. And then they went down one day and they saw their LMR traffic spike 300% mm -hmm. because they didn't realize just how much of the information was, was happening. And um, what we're seeing more and more is uh, more different kinds of information coming. And, and as we look at the possibilities with the Internet of Things and uh, the kind of sensor data that's going to be out there. I, and that just, should scare us to no end on how much we rely on data in our own lives. Frankly, half the new firefighters that I hire, they have no idea how to drive to freaking Walmart totally. without looking at their phone. <laughs> so we don't, but we, we have not created the redundancy that we need in communications at all. We're nowhere near the mesh that we need to ensure that redundancy occurs. We're very, very vulnerable, I think, at this period of public safety than we've ever been before. Um, we have a requirement that every, at least the captain on a fire engine carries a pager. Why? Because it's the last backup and we still can't even get them to do that. They rely 100% on their, on their devices. Interesting. Dan, Dan, if I could, Dan stole my word there, redundancy. I mean, it's about building redundancy, isn't it? And, and we saw this, we've seen this over in my former life and obviously where we are now. I mean, where what we're trying to do at Rapid is provide, um, even when systems go down, 
trying to provide that situational awareness, that location accuracy on calls so that folks inside the ECC are able to understand, right, well, this call is coming in from this number in this location, even when um, systems go down. So it is about redundancy. And, and it's about, I think, the evolution of the thinking of public safety combined, hopefully, with the evolution of the market and, and bringing those two together in ways that provide solution sets for public safety. But it's not going to it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a generational fix over time. Yeah, I mean, at the heart and soul of this is just going to be the data consumption. Where, where I mean, I'm an older person here, so I kind of saw the evolution happen. But our kids, my kids, my grandkids, are growing up with phones in their hands. So the data consumption market will grow. It's inevitable. It's whether or not we can manage it and govern it from a public safety standpoint. You don't want all this information out on the public sector, right? You don't necessarily want all this uh, information out on the public domain, I should say. So how do we govern this? I mean, I think this is a big societal question in, as a whole. You know, right now, Google and Amazon and Apple, and they're, they're collecting loads and loads and loads of data on you. I mean, it's, it's probably somewhat nefarious. <laughs> but if you think about what your phone does and how much, just sit there and look at the settings in your phone. Your smartphone is just, you know, apps. You talk about Walmart. Why does Walmart need access to all my, you know, my camera, my microphone and all this? It's, you know, it's all sh shrouded in this uh, era of convenience. So it's inevitable. But the question really is, we're going to end up, I think, as a society on data overload. We're going to have too much data and it's not going to be practical for humans to process that. And I think that's where artificial intelligence, uh, you know, autonomy comes in. So there are gonna be some tasks that I think we can, we can let the computers do. And we can have a high degree of confidence that the computer's gonna do it well and maybe even better. You know, there's this uh, term in AI, in the AR world called semantic understanding. We are actually working on it, where the drone can look at something and understand what it's looking at. So in a, in a law enforcement situation, in a, in a patrol overwatch situation, we can track, we can determine the difference between the victim and the perpetrator. So that's what semantic understanding is gonna give us the ability to do. And so, you know, is there gonna be some learning curves? Is there gonna be some bumps along the road? Yeah, we're, we're training the machines to do the, the thinking essentially, but we can't, you know, we can't completely be removed from the, the formula here. You know, it is sort of the, the Skynet, uh, you know, scenario. <laughs> the machine's gonna take over and replace the humans with machines. You know, we're always going to be able to, to throttle that or control that or govern that. And that's, that's really going to be the challenge, right? That's going to be the huge challenge. Vendors will end up with the lion's share of the data, you know, until, uh, until governance catches up, right? That's generally how that goes. So, you know, the Googles of the world are going to own the data. They're going to be on their servers and their server farms. They've invested, you know, millions and billions of dollars in this, this technology. That technology is coming whether we want it or not. So, you know, I just work for one of those companies that is on the bleeding edge of pushing the envelope. So it'll be a really interesting conversation I think we have as a society of how do we manage this. Okay. And um, I know, you know, Skydio is so well known for the aerial drones. Are you all looking at all on terrestrial um, drones and, and underwater? Yeah, not at the time, but there, you know, if you think about drones as a flying robot, there are a lot of robotic uh, companies, you know, Boston Dynamics is one that I think a lot of people are familiar with, little ghost dog, right? So the ability, in, especially like in a fire emergency situation where you can put a robot either flying or crawling or, or riding or driving, however it gets in there, right? But the, the main thing is you're getting a computer in there to, and with the vision of, of sensors to see what's going on there and, and relay that data in real time back to the command center. So it's still humans in the loop. It's still humans, but what you're not doing is putting the human in the dangerous situation up front until you can assess what's going on. Well, and to that point, what are some of the, I mean, everybody knows, hey, there's cameras on, on these things, but what other sensors are you all putting in? What, what is being requested, frankly, from the market? Yeah, I mean, EO and IR are the two main ones, right? That's the, the visual camera and the, the, the uh, thermal camera. You can do multi-spectral cameras. Uh, basically, any sensor, LiDAR, you mentioned LiDAR earlier. Um, there, there are a lot of different types of sensors you can put on this. I think the application for sensors, I know uh, uh, methane gas detection was one that we were looking at. Um, 
you know, in our, in our drones, we don't focus on some of those, I would say they're more niche uh, type sensors, but they're all out there and, you know, you can find them and you can find many of them that are, you know, that will fit to a, to a drone. Okay. And what are the, you know, a few years ago, there was a big push on, you know, trying to do beyond line of sight with, with, with drones and things like that. Where does that stand now? Can I do it? And, and what do I have to meet to be able to uh, do some of those things? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. If you're not familiar, uh, the FAA has a rule under the Part 107 uh, license to operate a commercial drone called a visual line of sight. That means you got to maintain uh, eyes on your drone while it's up in the air. That visual line of sight is obviously limited uh, to what you can see, which is generally like two to you know, 1,500 to 2,000 feet, roughly. Uh, when you're talking about remote-operated drones, that's removing the, uh, the pilot from the location of the drone. So that could be thousands of miles away. You now need this waiver from the FAA that is called BV loss or beyond visual line of sight. So the FAA regulatory body is evolving. Uh, they're coming along for the ride, but as usual, they're typically lagging behind the technology. Um, what I see with the FAA right now is what they call Basically, it's a, a shielded operation. So uh, in the utility sector that we work with a lot, we're putting these out on like the substations, for example. Uh, there's been a lot of concern with security around substation, people taking target practice on the transformers and things. Uh, obviously, that's you know a security issue, but it's also electricity issue if they take it out. So there, you know, a lot of our uh, utility customers are putting these essentially drone in a box, you know, a remotely controlled uh, house that has a drone inside of it that you can connect it to the internet and then connect and remotely control it. You do have to get a waiver for that. And the FAA has been issuing them, uh, albeit slow. They're, they're getting out there slowly, but I see a bigger shift in the FAA to accept it. There's a term they call uh, shielded operation where we basically define the airspace in that particular location as a controlled airspace that's not going to, because the con concern is really just uh, interference with manned aircraft. So that's the FAA's concern. So again, just trying to define an airspace that only the drone will operate in a, and a manned aircraft will never operate in. You're seeing a lot more progress with the FAA in that area. Okay. And you, you mentioned, you know, that you're communicating with that, that drone with 5G and that, that sort of thing. When it gets beyond the, the, that network, um, does it automatically just turn around or um, I guess what, what's the fail safe? I... Yeah, that's a great question. So that uh, gets to the sort of heart and soul of what our drones do with autonomy, right? We build in the ability for the drone to think for itself, uh, which is not crazy. We're, we're sticking these, uh, like I mentioned, the, the utility substations at 345,000 volt substations. So it's not something you really want to mess with. <laughs> it's a lot of electricity. <laughs> And the drone can navigate in that environment without running into a circuit breaker or a transformer or something that would probably blow the drone up and take this, you know, take a half a city block out or something. Um, so with that, we build in autonomy that gives it some fail safes. Return to the dock or return to home. Uh, it, it maps it out vi with vision. So, you know, even if this, the 5G signal goes away completely, the drone still knows how to get back. And it, it knows, okay, I lost my... 5G signal, it'll, you know, usually wait about a minute and, and see if it comes back. And then if it doesn't, it'll initiate a return back to the dock. Okay. And one last thing, I have, with all of these LEO satellites and things like that, could, and especially the, with the satellite directed phone or directed device, do you see that as maybe extending the ability of, of these 5G networks to continue to, uh, uh, communicate with uh, a drone even well beyond the, the terrestrial network. Yeah, I mean, we're sort of agnostic to that. We don't really care how how the signal gets there, mm -hmm. uh, as long as the signal gets there. I mean, and again, we're reducing the subset of data down to you know what they call C two command and control. It's 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 actually less data than you would get off your remote controller if you're out there flying it with you know wiggling the sticks. So again, putting a lot more onus onto the drone to think and just sending the command sets in very small packets. So that could be, you know, we, we communicate with GPS satellites, although we don't navigate by them, we can navigate by them. 
Uh, we do that for a lot of just geolocation and GIS type of applications, uh, whether it's you know any type of LEO satellite or any type of uh, communication terrestrial or satellite based. Uh, you know we're sort of agnostic to it. Okay, uh, and uh, Rapid SOS is you know, based in the U.S. and you guys have almost what like eighty per eighty five percent of the PSAPs are using Rapid SOS today. Um, are you all looking? I mean. The problems that you all are solving here in the U.S. exist other parts of the world. Are you all looking to expand beyond that? Yeah, very much so. I mean, one of the areas we're looking at is is Europe. But Dan made a really good point earlier about um, data storage. So GDPR, big privacy rule over there in the, in Europe. That's a big, big issue. Um, when you think of cloud storage, if you go to a country like Germany. You can't just have one server for the entire country. There are 17 lenders, provinces, and you have to have a different server for each lender in Germany. And that is but one of 27 countries in the EU. And so there are local problems for local issues, right? And, and so we have to think about that as we're considering our international expansion. It touches, your question I think touches on the public safety marketplace at, at large. One of the things <clears throat> you know, we worked on at the First and Authority in my former life was um, building an international ecosystem of partners who are looking to deploy public safety networks not only in the United States but throughout the world. The same is for 911. If, if we just think of the public safety marketplace as its own entity, it is honestly too small. We all know it's too small for the commercial big boys to really make a difference. Um, we all saw when Apple did their big announcement for um, you know, satellite recovery and, and you know, they're giving that a thing away for free. That's a marketing expense in essence for Apple, right? If we in the public safety ecosystem are trying to get the tools in the hands of men and women running into harm's way, the ecosystem has to work internationally. You've got to build partners across the world. You've got to identify and build communication with companies, governments, et cetera, so we can build this public safety marketplace to a scale that can ultimately integrate commercial, um, commercial systems and solutions. So at Rapid, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build this ecosystem in the 911, 988, 112, whichever number emergency responses are around the world, so that we can have a seamless integration, a seamless user experience. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in an ECC in Mexico, uh, which we have, or in Canada, or you know, hopefully sometime this year in other countries around around the world. Okay. Wow, that's going to be 